today's journey through Tripoli begins here at the abandoned train station straight away we've got oil tankers with bullet holes in the side there's a lot of abandoned ones here these ones are some exit bullets they would have come from this way and it looks pretty mean that this might sound a bit naive but I didn't really expect it to be like this I just thought there'd be some old rusty trains never mind the bullet holes everywhere and this one what on earth made a hole that big oh and uh, if that hole wasn't big enough for you don't worry I've got you covered because look at the state of that surely that's got to be like an explosion from from the inside it's even like it's even like torn at the edges and for the tankers that weren't hit by bullets or missiles or whatever the bloody hell that hole's made by they've been penetrated by trees instead so so they've been here a while boys oh. ever wondered what an oil tanker looks like inside well we finally got a chance to have a look at it well this has been an interesting start to the day hasn't it even though they've got loads of bullet holes inside the bigger bullet hole bloody scenes this was the train station of Tripoli until you guessed it 1975 the breakout of the Lebanese civil war and well it's all, it's all just covered with bullet holes and other projectile holes When the train station was abandoned it was replaced by loads of multi-purpose buildings one of which i am in now and then these in turn were destroyed between 1975 and 1991. and quite oddly this family has chosen to make this site spot for their picnic <laughs> Actually saying that, this does now seem like a bit of a place for a family day out, oddly enough. Also not what I expected. There were a total of six locomotives left behind. If you're interested, there are two German G7s and four German G8s. Back when I was a kid, I was obsessed with steam trains, so this is pretty mint for me. And I think in fact the closest that I've ever actually been to one. Hey, I'm in. Eight-year-old Lewis is buzzing his fat little cheeks off at the minute. Here I am in my steam train, pulling some levers, twisting some knobs. I think over here is probably the the choo-choo lever as well. Look at that. This bit over here is obviously the the little snack compartment, the fridge they would have had back in the 19th century. And then I'd be down here shoveling my coal into there steaming across the Middle East heading for Syria and it would indeed have been Syria that I was heading towards on this train because this line went from Tripoli to Homs in Syria and interestingly this was actually the terminus the end of the line Tripoli for the whole famous Orient Express line in the 1920s 1930s and 1940s this this is where you got to on it there are a couple more locomotives outside these ones have obviously fared a bit less well there's more bullet holes and it's rustier and stuff but here are the other three locomotives from uh that have been left here this one especially look at that for a chunk taken out of it this place would have originally operated from 1911 up until during the First World War when the Ottomans uh, destroyed part of it for military reasons and then when the French took over Lebanon in 1920 that's a subject we'll cover later on but they took over 1920 and got it back on track literally and that is when it became part of the, the Orient Express 20s, 30s and 40s. Well, that was a pretty spicy start to the day, wasn't it? Um, now we're just going to head towards the Corniche, basically the Cleethorpes prom of Tripoli. <laughs> Ah, 
Is that the first dog of the trip? I think it might be. Ah, look at this one as well, little meathead. And yeah, that was the core niche, much like the one we saw in Beirut. Everyone just bezzing around on roller skates, selling balloons and having a pretty good time. However, all is not necessarily well on the Tripoli front because although the infamous civil war of Lebanon finished about 30 years ago, which has given most of the country a long time to repair and rebuild, etc, etc, it's not been that smooth for Tripoli. And that's because a lot of its prosperity, its draws have disappeared. Recently, the airports closed down. Um, a lot of the riots that happened in Lebanon, in fact, most of the riots that happened in Lebanon about the government and stuff are said to actually happen here rather than in Beirut or other parts of the country. And it's probably for that reason that the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office, AKA the bit of the government that decides where is safe and not safe to travel to, has, even when Lebanon's been safe to travel to, they've said, mm, maybe you should avoid Tripoli and labeled it as a place that they advise against travel unless absolutely necessary. It kept that status even until as recently as I think about a year ago I last saw it like that um, but although we've not quite got the green light on it just yet it is getting much much better although saying that with the demonstrations that have started back up again with the recent whatever's happened with the government I don't know about that but anyway all I'm interested in today is is it a safe place to walk around and what is there to be doing? All right, I've tried about eight different ways to get into this place, but I can't. Everything's fenced off. Everything's bloody fenced off in Lebanon. So you have to appreciate it from a distance, I'm afraid. Behind this fence is Rashid Karami International Fair. The idea behind this was to build 15 massive concrete structures, modernist structures, to make a kind of tourist hub for the city. But unfortunately, as with lots of things in the 70s, by the time it got to 1974, building was postponed. It was never quite finished because of, of course, the start of the Civil War. What the point is exactly of fencing it off, I don't know because there are people inside it, you can get inside it, it's just a public park kind of thing. For some reason they've decided to put about eight miles worth of fence around it. Um, in fact there are gates to get in, they've just decided to chain them closed. Again, no idea what the point of that even is. Luckily they're not that important, they're just pretty cool things, so meh, meh is my answer to that. Anyway, I give up. I'm going to take this opportunity to have a break and talk a bit actually about the French. I mentioned earlier that the French took over Lebanon in 1920. Um, so we might as well go through why that made such a big difference in Lebanon and continues to today. So the reasons why they took over don't actually matter for the time being. I'm not going to bore you with it. Just know that they did take over. They also had Syria and other parts of this region. The French then decided the best course of action to keep everything under control was to separate it into different nations. So they tried to make a Lebanese nation, a Syrian nation, etc, etc. But the Arabs didn't really like that very much. They preferred having a greater Arab homeland, a big, nice, cosy place for all Arabs to live side by side. And so they told France to do one. They took a census in 1932, which revealed that 40% of the population was in fact Christian. The rest of it made up by Sunni and Shiite Muslims. And they decided that, that you know, this is a pretty big divide. Maybe we should divide the power in proportion to the population of each religion. Basically, Christians made up the majority, the 40%, because the 60% was split equally, 30% Sunni Muslim and 30% Shiite Muslim. And therefore the Christians should have the most power over the country. They decided that the best way to do it was to make sure the president is always a Christian, the prime minister is always a Sunni Muslim, and the speaker of the house is always a Shiite Muslim. They also gave six seats in parliament to Christians for every five they gave to Muslims, and they made sure the Christians were in charge of the army as well. Obviously, Lebanon was pretty fuming about this idea. It sounds pretty fair on paper, but it is not in practice. Lebanon was fuming. They decided to change the constitution themselves to write out any mention of the French authority in it at all and so the French were essentially kicked out of the land that they controlled in the first place and then to make matters worse the USA, the UK and all the Arab states backed Lebanon's independence and therefore it became independent. So France were booted out, Lebanon gained independence, everyone's happy but the system stuck and it's that system that the French came up with that is still in place 
today and that is the system of course that the people of Lebanon are pretty angry about because the people that I've spoken to at least have all kind of said that it's an outdated system the sectarianism is just it's just weird it's just not how countries progress nowadays and it's way too easily corruptible and that's why everyone's demonstrating that's why everyone's frustrated and it's places like Tripoli and Beirut that are most angered by it and essentially it's all France's fault And we are now into the old centre of Tripoli. This is an area called Altar. It's kind of where, as you can see, all the hustle and bustle goes on. There's also the uh, famous clock tower as well. This area is where you'll find most of the old stuff in the city. A bit like this, the Mansouri Mosque, built in 1294 AD by the Mamluks. And here we are in one of the city's many souks, really old marketplaces basically. If you've been to Morocco, you'll have seen a lot of things like this. I believe there are nine souks in total and historically they would have been separated into their individual guilds. So you would have had like a fragrant souk and then the separate part of the city you've had the gold souk, etc, etc. And today they're just kind of mixed. They're just little fascinating windy streets to mooch about. There's plenty of them. Oh, and by the way, if you're an electrician, don't bother coming here because the way they've wired this place up will make you feel sick. Look at the state of it all. This is what happens when you try and turn a really old city into a modern city with electricity far too quickly. What a mess. And then just round here, we've got another old mosque. This one's called Botasi Mosque. It was built about the same time as the other one. This one was in 1310. Probably not the cleanest river I've ever set eyes on. But anyway, the city is indeed full of little wonderful old souks as well as hammams and other Ottoman implemented things. But now we're taking a bigger step back in time to, you guessed it, yep, it's another castle boys. And in fact, you are just kind of free to walk around all of it. I'm in a, I'm in a dungeon at the minute. Anyway, I'm not going to dwell for too long here. I am fairly short on time. So let's go for a, a brisk yomp and blast through some of the facts. This place was first built in 636 AD, so about 1400 years ago by the Arabs and then was since used by the Crusaders, the Mamluks and the Ottomans. However, not much of what we are seeing here is from that original period because when the Crusaders came through here, yep, the pesky Crusaders, in about 1100 AD, they decided to build another citadel and therefore this is the citadel of Raymond de Saint-Gilles. That guy Raymond, Raymond IV to be precise, was one of the knights in the very first crusade and Tripoli was a really important city on the coast for them to take and they managed it and therefore when they did take over the place they built a fortress and he did it in his own name. If we look through one of these arrow slits you can see kind of why it was such a good location, it overlooks a river, a very very steep drop to the side so natural defence, it would also have been surrounded by a moat at some point as well. And today it is amongst the biggest fortresses in all of Lebanon, it's about 8,000 square metres this, it's pretty big. And from the very top, we have the stunning view of Tripoli as a whole. From up here, you can see pretty much everything we've visited in today's trip. You can see Al Mansouri Mosque, you can see the tops of the souks we were in. I've quite enjoyed Tripoli. I reckon with some time and some good fortune, it could end up quite the holiday destination. So fingers crossed. Wait a minute, look at these. We've got pigeons doing donuts. Look like the keys in the Harry Potter film, the one he's got a catch in the Philosopher's Stone. It's them. And on that unbeatable note, I reckon it's a pretty good point to uh, end the video. Yeah, I've quite enjoyed Tripoli. Overall, safe, interesting, and fingers crossed it could be pretty prosperous once again. Cheers, boys. See you in a bit.